Today's live show is sponsored by Ufizi. Stand up your developer platform in minutes with Ufizi. The Ufizi platform provides fast provision Kubernetes clusters for all your dev and testing needs. Every engineer gets self-service sandboxed virtual clusters. Every team can have centralized management of those clusters. It runs on their infrastructure or yours. Ufizi has deployment support for Helm, Customize, Kubernetes Manifest, and even Docker Compose. Their management platform has features such as sleep mode, time-based deletion, and resource quotas for avoiding overspending. Try their free starter tier today by spinning up your first sandbox cluster in under a minute at ufizi.com. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the show, people. We are live on YouTube. This is Normal. Hello. I'm glad you're here again. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Normal's my co-host now, and he randomly shows up, randomly doesn't show up. You you get to come and decide. I randomly decide. show up. <laughs> you, you randomly show up. There's a plan, but sometimes you're here and sometimes you aren't. So you're just going to have to show up live, people, to find out whether Normal is here. It's basically... We're gonna do some gambling a little bit before a show to see what what you think whether you think Nirmal's gonna be here or not. So I appreciate you being here this week. Awesome! Thanks for having me. So if you didn't know, uh, Nirmal works with AWS, and today we're gonna to be talking a lot about AWS. So I'm excited to get to it. We're gonna keep this short. Uh, this is a live show that turns into a podcast. You probably saw that while you were waiting for us to start. But there's a podcast, brettfisher.com. You just go there, find the podcast, or in your favorite podcast player. We also have a newsletter now, so you can find out who's going to be on the show this week, mm -hmm. what, what was just released on the podcast, and more on my free newsletter. Uh, of course, those are links all are below. Um, and finally, we have a Discord server right above us. Neural and I are hanging out in DevOps.fan. All week long, it's it's crazy in there. Um, today's questions, I don't even I haven't even looked at yet, but we now have events. We have swarm meetups. We have monthly hangouts for lunch and uh, on video. In case you are a DevOps professional or you're wanting to be one, and more. So just DevOps fan right there. Come hang out. That's where we're at. Let's get to our show because I'm excited to have our guest on today. Hello, Ken. Hey, Brett. How's it going? My Good. local friend. <laughs> we we are almost all local. We are, uh, in case you didn't know, I live in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Ken lives close by in Portsmouth. And Nermal is in North Carolina, just a couple of hours away. Yeah, super close. But we have to all be on the internet instead of hanging out in the real world because <laughs> I don't leave my house. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll meet Ken, at the thank beach you so sometime. Much. It'll be amazing. Y yes, I mean we, we keep talking about meeting up again. Um, luckily, we met years ago in the local physical meetup community. So if you're out there and you're in any city of any size, you probably have some sort of technology meetup. You might have a dedicated AWS one, a dedicated Kubernetes mm -hmm. one. Like we're lucky to have. Um, I think Ken and I might have met in a Ruby meetup many many years ago. Um, so get back to the real life meetups, people. They need your support. Yes. Um, they're trying. They're trying to kick it. How about you, Normal? Are you having meetups in your local area? I don't even. I, we didn't even ask before the show if you were. Yeah, um, a bunch of them are starting back up again. I, I just went to. I think it was a Hashi, Hashi Corp, like meetup. Um, they were doing uh, using ChatGPT to create Terraform. Which is pretty cool, um, cool. and yeah, that's I'm that's in. a whole another topic for another show for sure. And then um, we have the AWS uh, uh, community meetups are, are ramping up again, and a bunch of the other like DevOps oriented meetups. So for sure, they're starting again. They've they've been running, um, but the the attendance numbers are not like pre COVID yet. So we're trying to yeah, yeah. trying to kind of get back up there again. 
<laughs> I am surprised how long it's taken to get get a lot of our pre COVID meetups back and it, it's interesting in our local area. One of the things this isn't really a topic for today, but I'll shut up after this. Uh, we have noticed like there's a generational thing happening where all of a sudden the people that are starting up the meetups again aren't the people we know. And a lot of us that run have been running meetups for decades here in our area. It's like who are all these people? And they're all coming out of the cracks. And it, all of us old timers are realizing there's a there's some fresh blood, and it's pretty exciting actually to I like that to have new people. All right. We're not here to talk about meetups. We're here to talk about Lambda. All right. Yes. Ken, start us off. The, I mean, I don't know what year Lambda was released. It was a while mm-hmm. ago. It was a big deal. Everybody was talking about it. And now teams just use it, and there's not a lot of 101, what does Lambda do? Why do I need to care about Lambda? But I get this question in our in our chat a lot, in our mm-hmm. Discord server. I get it in the, in the courses a lot about what does Lambda have to do with containers? Do you have a good answer for that? <laughs> yeah, and I think maybe I'll just go ahead and kick us off with like a little intro too. So like for, um, uh, so my name is Ken Collins. I'm a, I oh, work yes. for uh, Custom Inc. Uh, I'm a principal engineer there. I've just started, I think I just hit about 10 years there at Custom Inc. That's the t-shirt place, not the tattoo place or any other place that has named Custom Inc in it, but it's, it's the t-shirt place. Uh, they're up in Northern Virginia. Uh, it's an amazing company. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I think we've been called the AWS of T-shirts before uh, because once you put an order <laughs> in, you know, getting the logistics and shipping that order out, there's a lot of work involved. So, yeah, Man- uh, manage T-shirts as a service, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the tech stack there is pretty big. So if that's, uh, um, I think one of the things I became, I've been sort of involved in the open source community for probably my entire programming career. I'd say that's probably maybe 14 years now. Uh, I've been fortunate enough that a lot of the stuff that I have done is open source. So, you know, my career has gone back to, you know, running the SQL Server adapter group for Ruby. I uh, was even lucky enough to visit Microsoft when they were just starting off their open source journey and they had reached out to Ruby and Python communities. So uh, I've been around the block a few times and for the past maybe four years or five years, I think uh, four or five, I've really sort of been retooling my career and just learned Lambda. And that started about, I think I've been a hero for three years. And that came about with some of the open source work that I had done around running Ruby and Rails inside of Lambda way before Lambda containers was out. But just like, uh, I thought that was kind of like just sort of setting some 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 background where I've come from. Uh, I've done a lot of open source work. Uh, we have a website that we do with, uh, uh, with we run Rails and Lambda. And that's really where I started a lot of the learning off for containers. Yeah. And rail, I'll be honest, rails, I have a lot of rails friends. You have a lot of rails friends and they're not always container people. (laughs) I actually have friends that, that are still not using containers because it's Ruby can be such a wonderful ecosystem of tooling that they're not compelled to make it simpler through containers. What was your sort of, Okay, I'm now going to be doing my Ruby in a, a, you know in containers kind of moment. What did you do? You recall that? Yeah, that, that was really uh, custom. Inc has been through a couple cloud journeys, right? So we went from uh, hosting our own you know our own data centers into the cloud. Then once you're in the cloud, you typically start asking yourself, how do I use the cloud well? Uh, so mm-hmm. that meant for us, we had a large migration from EC2 to containers, and that's very typical for a lot of companies, uh, Kubernetes. So it's easy. To stand up Kubernetes, or at least it's uh, sort of easier today. But it's it was kind of a logical choice, right? Like you have a hundred, say, hundred fifty Rails applications, and you just need to stand up Kubernetes and run them in there. So like we had the the cloud migration, the lift and shift, then we had the EC two uh, for using modernized compute, and part of that modernized compute was exploring AWS Lambda. So are you? Is there a transition from or part of that? Now you have containers running on you know pods as and on Kubernetes on something like EKS. Mm-hmm. Is there another part that's going to serverless? And uh, I would imagine so, since since you're on the show. But what's how how are you making that decision? Uh, a lot of it was me experimenting on just how far I could push it, right? And I think I've been doing that since you know I think Lambda came out with containers in 2022. So there's a you know when we talk about Lambda. 
you kind of have to first sort of level set yourself where Lambda is now versus where many people maybe explored it going back all the way to two seven, what is it, 2017, I think, when it was released. So I've been exploring Lambda for large workloads for probably since uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, easily about a year before containers came out. So then it was like, how much can this thing do? How much workload can I put into it? Can I frankly just abuse it and put a whole Rails app in it, uh, which everybody just just sounds horrible, right? But like, <laughs> I'm always trying to think where the technology is going and just play around with it at that point to see like, eventually I think things will catch up, right? So to me, the thing that looked attractive was, okay, auto scaling, for us, learning auto scaling on Kubernetes was pretty hard, right? Like it's it, it once you Dockerize things and, and run it in Kubernetes, there's there's still more work to do. You have to figure out if you're going to do memory scaling, you know, mm -hmm. uh, CPU scaling, HPAs, VPAs, all this mm -hmm. stuff. And what I was really trying to to do was sort of explore the way you could put a container or at least any code in sort of a managed runtime. Uh, back then, it was the zip format, uh, and then sort of get this benefits of total cost of ownership of uh, super fast scaling compute. And it's ended up being a pretty good experiment. And the technology has come a long way since then that provides like that thing that we all want, right? I just want to ship a container and don't think about it. Like that's that's really, I think, where everybody wants. They just want to put their workload somewhere and think about the business value mm -hmm. and, 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 and make their workload do the thing that they want to do, whether it's a web app or some job or something like that. But like nobody likes dealing with compute and servers or anything like we had other things to do. So it was kind of uh, the value was uh, just focusing on your application as much as possible. And what what kind of architecture? So you, you mentioned kind of uh, jamming a heavyweight, or maybe not heavyweight, but a large Ruby application onto uh, Lambda in some kind of way. What what's the architectural pattern there? I just want to kind of give an idea to our audience of what what workload patterns work best that, that you've seen. Um, ver, you know, that, that run on Kubernetes versus that are running on, on Lambda? Uh, I haven't found any good patterns yet. So I, I think the, the things that you, that, well, let's put it this way. Lambda has some limitations with the managed services that sit in front of it. And there's ways around these now, but I think a great example would be, does your web request need to last longer than 30 seconds? Hmm. So that's kind of a hard and fast rule. API gateway is not going to last more than 30 seconds. So if you have uh, a Rails application that maybe has an active admin aspect to where somebody wants to download half the database every day and run a report, that's probably not going to be a good workload unless you sort of refactor it to do like a, you know, like a, a background job process that emails a link when it's ready or something like that. But uh, there's certain things at the high level that you can basically say, hey, you know, run through like a, a rubric, right? And if 30 seconds is one of the things that you need to do, back in the day, it used to be like, do I want to spend a lot of time building a Lambda layer to get system dependencies? And when containers came out, that just changed everything. So basically, we still have the 30 second limit, we still have a six megabyte limit, in most cases, on the response payload. But past that, the apps run fine, and they always have. Uh, and I can kind of talk about that a little bit more. But there's never like, hey, this workload, can do here well for Kubernetes. Um, I think a lot of people perhaps think that they've got sort of specialized workloads and I've never really seen these specialized <laughs> workloads, right? Like Rails apps, many things, uh, even at custom ink scale where we're doing a lot of compute, I just haven't really seen the differentiation that's that really makes a case one way or the other. Interesting. So uh, kind of saying that um, you don't, don't be afraid to try uh, mm -hmm. serverless compute or, or Lambda um, for some of those workloads that you might not consider to be able to run on something like uh, a serverless architecture. Um, just give it a shot for sure. Um, so how do you how do you deploy these applications on, on Lambda? Oh, that's a good question. So right now, a lot of the things that we use are basically just AWS SAM. So SAM is a uh, serverless application model. It's a tool written by AWS that is a, I don't know if it's, what should I call it, a superset or a subset of CloudFormation. So basically, you can express your serverless app in a very few lines of YAML. Subset. It, subset, thanks. So uh, very few lines of YAML. You say, hey, here's the, uh, here's the API gateway I need, which is basically your Nginx reverse proxy. Uh, here's the 
the local director where I'm building the container. Uh, and, you know, maybe if you have other AWS resources, so like if you wanted to, that that CloudFormation template could express maybe an S3 bucket or a DynamoDB table, and you just run bin deploy, um, and it pretty much does everything for you. Now, you can get complicated after that. You could set it up with a lot of GitOps and uh, custom tooling, but pretty much at the end of the day, uh, deploying a serverless app, you can do it with AWS SAM relatively easily in just a few lines of code. Very cool. We had a question real quick. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anton asked, uh, basically, is there ARM available in Lambda? Uh, ARM, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think uh, I'd have to check the schedule when that came out, but ARM was released in on September in 2021. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Yeah, so Graviton instances, I mean, I, I love the ARM64 instances uh, and, what, and what you get inside of EC2, but I never really paid attention to whether Lambda could take advantage of that. That's really cool. Uh, One of the so, things yes, I found both. really hard with that, Brett, is the CI CD pipeline. So, like, um, you know, I'm familiar with Circle CI and GitHub Actions. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like GitHub Actions, it's just super easy to get into. Doesn't have ARM64 workers yet. So, like, it's really hard to do. Uh, you know, to build that Docker image. I don't know what yeah. a lot of people are using. Yeah. But like you have to match up your CI CD pipeline. Like even if the service has it, right? Like then now you have to go back in and make sure that your CI CD pipeline can do it, right? And if your yeah. CI CD pipeline, GitHub Actions, doesn't have ARM workers, or then all of a sudden you're going to have to use BuildX. That's going to maybe yeah. QEMU. That's going to take yeah. a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of things out now. Um, we, we can totally have this conversation afterwards, but yeah, there's, <laughs> I have like three or four ways and uh, more are coming that I'm aware of that I'm excited about because I think at, I've been very like, I don't know, once I got my Raspberry Pi, I, I started to become, you know, pro, pro arm. And then of course we all got Macs that have arm in them. And I just, I love how fast they can be and how cheap they can be on the, on the, on the cloud. So I'm always trying to advocate to people to build you know, the, their container images with BuildX or something like it that will essentially give you multiple um, architectures. architectures. And yeah, and mm -hmm. um, so I, one of the things I try to do with teams when I'm either consulting or training them is like, let's let's get your, your build set up going now, even if you don't need ARM, like let's just build it now. Cause you're gonna, if you don't have the Ar MacBooks on ARM yet, it's gonna happen. If you don't have, mm -hmm. you know, instances in the cloud, someone's gonna ask you, hey, can we save money? And, that's an easy trigger to pull, easy meaning easier than you know improving performance across a wide base of code. It's a, it's comparatively easy, so yeah. That, but that is a challenge, and I I'm actually surprised that GitHub Actions doesn't yet have. I mean, they have Mac builders, they have Windows builders. I I got to feel like ARM64. It's actually on I their feel roadmap. Like it's been I just two don't weeks think so, yeah. away for two years, right? I've been <laughs> watching that roadmap issue for so long. Yeah. It's like yeah. any week now for years. <laughs> yeah, at least Linux ARM. Um, I mean, the Mac Macs are probably going to have, if they don't already, they have ARM M, M1s, mm. you know, on, on Mac side for building, but mm -hmm. it is weird that Linux doesn't have it yet, which maybe is just an Azure limitation. I don't know. Anyway. I don't know. And, well, I was looking at the, another one of Anton's questions about like running an R app and like normal, this makes me think to one of your questions, right? So when he mentioned sort of bells and whistles, right? And mm -hmm. like, let's say if your Rails app has some bells and whistles to using WebSockets. That's not really easy to do in a container runtime with Lambda. You actually have to change your code inside to deal with that, right? There's there's managed web sockets with uh, API Gateway, but like for me, one of the values where I look to use Lambda containers is like, do I have to change the code inside of it? And that's a that's a mm -hmm. threshold that like I don't want to change my code for a container runtime. And I think eventually Lambda makes that easy. There's a lot of things it does with things like the Lambda Web Adapter, uh, with how we do secrets management. Uh, but ultimately, if there are a lot of bells and whistles, right, like maybe you spin up Puma or something like that, and you want to run five concurrent workers. But like, I think the WebSocket one is one of the biggest bells and whistles for Rails developers. I'd have to maybe hear more from Anton on that. But um, yeah, so if your app did had, uh, if your app had WebSockets, I would say don't put it on, don't put it on yeah. Lambda right now. Yeah. You mentioned the web adapter. Can you can you speak a little bit more about what that is? Yeah. So. Lambda, in order to run your image on AWS Lambda, and normally this is why people think uh, Lambda is sort of microservices first versus just taking a, uh, an image and being able to use the entry point and config, is that what you need is an interface between Lambda, it's called the runtime interface, 
between its invoke model and hitting some sort of function in your code. Now, Kubernetes, this is easy to think about, right? It's just changing the command, right? So the function is basically going to be, let me spin up a server or something. So most people have web applications and that's really where I kind of come from is like a web app. Let me just put a web app on a container and spin it up. Mm -hmm. So the Lambda web adapter is really just two things. It's, and I think it looks very familiar for people that are putting applications and workloads on Kubernetes, specifically web projects, and that it's going to be a runtime interface client and it's going to have that that sort of native adapter in between the way that Lambda needs to talk and the way that the internal application receives it. It is also a reverse proxy. So it allows you to spin up mm -hmm. a any type of web server on the inside of your container, whether it be Puma, Nginx, uh, literally WebBrick if you're on Ruby, Express uh, if you're on JavaScript, and the Lambda web adapter will basically do all the work and reverse proxy back down. So it's almost like having a, like a little Nginx sidecar pattern all with inside the, uh, the same container. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense in the, se in the sense of back to your earlier statement around trying to minimize the amount of change of your code that you need to do to mm -hmm. fit this model, right? So using something like this allows you to still stick with, if I'm interpreting it right, st allows you to still stick with the web server um, entry point or component that you might already have in your Ruby app, for example, or in your Ruby container, and then still be able to have it be invoked by, uh, through Lambda. Yeah. And I, I think that's really powerful. And I, I think the thing on the left-hand side too, shows you the different ways that you can basically integrate from an HTTP point, like application load balancers. The newest one is in the middle there. That's called Lambda function URLs. And that's, particularly interesting. So it's almost like the, it's almost like the AWS team for Lambda was like, Hey, it's really hard to, you know, keep pushing the product forward coupled to another product API gateway. So they took, I don't know if they did this or not, but this is what it looks like for me. It looks like they basically took what they needed from API gateway, integrated API gateway as a service inside of Lambda. They call it Lambda function URLs. It's freaking free, right? So you don't even have to pay for it. Um, and then you get these really cool things out of it. The way it integrates with the Lambda web adapter is that you get streaming support for free. So if you've ever written any sort of next gen AI applications where we've all seen chat GPT streaming the responses back, mm -hmm. uh, you can now get that in Lambda too, which used to be a barrier. Uh, you used to have to say, hey, is my app doing streaming? Uh, yes, uh, Kubernetes. Now you can actually do it on Lambda and for free and with a reverse web proxy that just looks like a container that runs anywhere else. I like uh, it. Another, another part of that um, picture that you just had up, Brett, is yeah. on the bottom there, it says zip and what was it again? Zip package, zip package or, or container, container image. Or image. Yeah. What does that mean, Ken? Okay. So when Lambda came out in 2017, it was the big thing was, is you just write your code and ship your code and we'll, the whole runtime will manage, right? So like if, if you wrote the code and the code was written and the runtime was uh, node 12, then, you know, there was no, like the runtime was in the control of the, of AWS. And one day they'll come along and they go, Hey, the node 12, we've all seen this with Heroku, right? Like Cedar stacks going away or something like that. And they'll say, Hey, node 12 is going away. You have to update your code to work with 13 or something. So that was the zip format, right? It was basically zipping your code up and they would just reference your code and put it into a directory in the managed runtime. 2020, they came out with the OCI container image and they basically just described it as a package format, right? So rather than package your code as a zip, you would package your code. That's something that looks very familiar and that's an OCI image. And the reason I think that changed everything because like uh, we talked a little bit about like how you don't want to change your code when you're shipping a container, right? Like why should I rewrite my code to work on one container platform versus another? Well, imagine like, uh, writing your code in such a way to where like, let's say if I wanted to talk to my SQL and I needed a system dependency, like a, like a MariaDB dependency to compile my native extensions for, you really couldn't do that in Lambda. You'd have to make this thing called a Lambda layer, which is another zip file that's magically packed up in an op directory here. Then your other zip file would have to link to it through static linking or dynamic linking. And it was just a huge pain. I think everybody understands containers. Everybody understands where if I need system dependencies, like my SQL client libraries or anything 
that my workload may need, you just apt get install it and just ship the whole container. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I think there's some advantages there, which is um, uh, determining uh, what part of your application in your container is frequently changed and which parts are infrequently changed. And mm -hmm. it, being able to, um, and, and this kind of goes back to just um, uh, getting better at building your Docker Docker file or writing your Docker files and the layers. And uh, Brett, you have tons of videos and content around optimizing the Docker files and, and, the, and those layers, but it comes down to kind of determining which parts of that container are infrequently changing and which parts mm -hmm. are frequently changing. And um, the Lambda OCI layer support uh, allows the whole entire Lambda system to take advantage of, of that uh, granularity, right? So uh, being able to uh, keep the infrequently changing parts, the dependencies that might be common across a lot of your different web applications and instances of those web applications or yeah. other types of applications from uh, the parts that are frequently changing, which are oftentimes your business logic or the or the actual code that's being uh, that's doing work. Correct. <laughs> yes, and it sounds like normal. You want to talk about cold starts. <laughs> so this, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, yes. You know, let's talk about cold starts and and what that means. Um, this comes up whenever you talk about. Uh, well, uh, even in the Kubernetes world, when you're trying to scale, mm -hmm. the idea of how fast can I scale and how how granular mm -hmm. can I get and respond to um, either uh, traffic that I knew is going to be coming in or or oftentimes uh, events that are uh, 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 non non deterministic is a little bit too too strict, but you, you might not know that that. that that wave of traffic is coming, or you have to do a large amount of processing. So Ken, tell me a little bit more about um, your opinion on cold starts. <laughs> and first of all, what are cold starts? Um, yes. Is it an, is it a thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's the first thing like, so it's, it's when people have used Lambda for a long time, like cold starts were a problem. And those, they sometimes it's a problem that they made up that it's not really a problem. And sometimes it was. So let me give you a good example. Ancient history in Lambda, if you attached it to a VPC, you would suffer a penalty for spinning up a new Lambda, whether it's zip, container, whatever, like you would get a penalty for that new invocation or that, you know, sort of as new traffic was rolling in and you had to bring in new instances, I'm air quoting that, uh, you know, runtime functions to, to service the request, you would get a cold start. And with a VPC, I think it was maybe like five or six seconds. And that just was like not a go, like, because how many workloads do you have that can't talk to a network, right? Like, I don't yeah. know, all of mine do, right? <clears throat> don't tell me what I can't talk to. I want to talk to the network, right? So, right. The, um, so first and foremost, all those have sort of been evaporated. There is no such thing as a, a penalty for VPC connectivity. Um, and then the question becomes is like, what is a cold start? So let's invert that a little bit if we can. Let's talk a little bit about what a cold start is on Kubernetes. And then let's see if we can backtrack into what a cold start is on Lambda. Because I think when people say cold start for Lambda, they're just going, well, Lambda has cold starts. What we do too on Kubernetes, let's talk about that. And then I think that can maybe frame the, the discussion a little bit. Sure. Um, so a cold start in Kubernetes is, uh, you know, in a Kubernetes cluster, you have some, some amount of nodes, um, some compute mm -hmm. that you have supporting your pods. And uh, say you have three EC2 instances supporting your EKS cluster. And they're at capacity. So they're running the most amount of pods that they can at the CPU and memory requests of those pods. Then you get that N plus one, that next pod that you're asking to uh, the Kubernetes scheduler to run, it goes to the nodes and it says, I don't have any compute. So I need to communicate to uh, the scaling, the, your compute scaling system, which is, which is either auto, you know, cluster auto scaler, either you're doing it manually, or if you're, uh, uh, using EKS, you can um, use Carpenter, which which is another way of scaling the compute. That takes time, you know, in the order of seconds um, to communicate to the uh, EC2 API, uh, spin up a new node, uh, bring that node into the cluster, and then Kubernetes can schedule that pod. Then the pod takes some time to, 
you know, the container takes some time to initiate, uh, to initialize, and then it's ready for, for, uh, accepting traffic. And so we're in the order of, you know, seconds, right. Um, multiple, uh, double digit seconds of, of, uh, time that would be a, the, the kind of cold start, um, example for Kubernetes. Right. So here's the interesting thing that I heard you say, but we don't talk about, which is, is that during that point before something is needed to be scheduled, there is something under pain, right? So if you're doing CPU scaling or memory, something's got to hurt in order to yes. trigger that next thing that you said is only a couple seconds, right? Yep. So, so what I have typically found is, is that when people talk about cold starts, they want to measure how fast, like Kubernetes can spin this up in two seconds. And let's say a Rails app, right? Let's say typically a Rails app is going to boot on Kubernetes and Lambda in about three to four seconds, right? That's how fast Rails is going to boot. It's going to, it'll be slower if you have to talk to some database connections mm -hmm. or something like that. But in general, you got about three to four seconds. So I find what people do is they go, okay, well, I'm going to measure this and I'm measure this, right? And let's say if Kubernetes is scaling by um, uh, larger units, right? Like rocks and Lambda is more like pebbles or sand. Then you'll go like, you'll, you'll take the math and you'll go, okay, I can scale one pod here in two seconds. And it'll happen every 10 minutes. Uh, but maybe in Lambda, I have 15 to 20 to 30 smaller units of work that take two to three seconds. Here's what you really should measure. You should not measure those individual cold start times. What you should measure is in your application, the hurt. And typically that is request queuing, right? So like if mm -hmm. something's under mm -hmm. CPU or memory constraints, then at some point you're either going to have slower requests that you need to measure that lead up to that next scaling event, or you're going to have request queuing waiting for the next resource to open up, right? And you can put those two together and you can kind of come up with some good like application performance metrics. And every time I have switched from Kubernetes to Lambda, I've either meet or beat percentiles for requests of uh, duration. And I can talk a little bit about what percentiles are and how to measure outliers, but Lambda auto scaling, even though you'll have to get those like a two or three seconds, you know, for uh, a thing to scale up and you'll see more of it. They typically evaporate well past P99 uh, numbers. And when you look at the numbers and, and you can find some outliers and maybe do some performance stuff, but in most cases, the heavier workload you have, the more you're never going to see cold start uh, issues because you're measuring that that bigger number. Does that sort of make sense, right? Like the, the, the application performance monitoring and the request queuing? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a step back from what you're saying um, and or, or uh, kind of summarize. Uh, and this is this is a common problem across the different types of architectures that you pick, um, especially from an operator point of view, is that uh, you know, you get your 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 system up and running, whether it's Kubernetes or or your full on architecture, and then you think about, okay, what is my what do I need to monitor? And Kubernetes has a ton of metrics, and uh, uh, you know, you get lots of logs, you get lots of metrics, you get uh, maybe you're tracing your application. There's thousands of metrics that you can take a look at, um, but are those metrics important to you? Right, Ken, and that's what you're kind of saying. Like, maybe we're you're not looking at the right thing, the actual thing that matters for your application. So, when we're when we're looking at our application performance and trying to figure out how to performance tune our applications, whether they're they're on Lambda, whether they're on Kubernetes or EKS or a combination of both of those, um, you have to take a step back and really understand. Okay, what matters for the end user here, right? Is it mm -hmm. the is it the amount of memory CPU pain in the cluster? Maybe, maybe not. Or is it like what you're talking about? Is it the um, amount of requests that are coming in? And then how does my system respond to that? And am I optimizing for that? Um, yeah. is, is that a good summarization of what you're kind of uh, pointing at? Yeah, and I could share a, like a slide here I did a while back on uh, I think I, I did a talk a while back ago that talked about the case for Rails on Lambda and a little bit about the custom make story. And we talked a little bit about the Lambda highlights. This is sort of slides around the, uh, you know, sort of resetting context around how things are done and where we were to where we are now. Uh, this is a slide I put together where 
you know, at Custom Inc., there is this, uh, our design lab, right? And that's driven by a whole bunch of other services that talk to other microservices. Like, so we have a microservice that does nothing but take the text that you enter in for the, that you're going to put on the t-shirt and turn it into a raster format that you can see while you're doing your design lab. And that's all it does. We call it Foundry. And it was by far on the commercial side of Custom Inc., which is different than the operational side, our hugest workload. And I was like, let's throw this thing at Lambda and see what it does. And everybody was like, well, we're going to have longer requests. You know, the cold starts are going to kill it. And it's a Rails app that's really just basically just doing some uh, ghost script stuff. And, and uh, I think it's ghost script. I'd have to take a look. Uh, but this is the before and after for the P50, P95, and, and P99. We meet our beat, all the numbers, and we were using New Relic for this, uh, for that workload. So from a customer standpoint, which is the one to me matters the most, um, this thing, and this was even before Lambda containers, this is four years ago, and things have gotten better. Very yeah, can you go back to that, that previous slide real quick? I thought it would just be worth you mentioning some of the highlights of that for the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, so let's see, our container, uh, right now you can ship a container on AWS Lambda and that can be up to 10 gigabytes in size, which I've never hit, <laughs> like I've done some, yeah. uh, I've done some AI uh, demos where I've like embedded like a 600 megabyte SQLite database inside the container. Uh, so, so, and six virtual CPUs, this one's interesting. Um, I've never had a need for more than one virtual CPU, right? So a Rails app, like I think you think, well, let's put it this way. When you're running a Rails app on Kubernetes, you have to think big. You have to run a web process that has maybe five concurrent workers and you're, 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 you're sending lots of requests per second to that. With Lambda, you're only going to have one request at one time hitting that particular function. Uh, so I've, you've only ever need one CPU. Uh, but if you have some workloads that need more of it, you can use up to six virtual CPUs. Uh, let's see, API Gateway, which the modern replacement now is function URLs, uh, is a fast and cheap web proxy. There's a whole operator aspect here. Um, <laughs> this whole operator aspect here that you were talking about, normal about like CloudWatch, uh, you get a lot of things for free in the observability space, but I definitely still think that your application shouldn't have to change. So you have internal application performance metrics, things like New Relic or Rollbar or Honeycomb, right? Those all still pretty much work the same exact way. Um, you know, I call out blue green deploys here and then provision concurrency. Um, that's a whole separate, that's an aspect of cold starts that never really needed it, but I can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, yeah, that's a good real... catch up. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to summarize and say that's a good. I'm oh, sorry. That's a... yeah. You're okay. Uh, there, a lot of us, like a lot of these tools, is it kind of a trend on this show? We we pay attention when there's announcements. We hear about some major new thing, and then there's all this subtle improvement over time that we, if unless you're really diving in and you're using that thing every day and you're obsessing over the new features you're not gonna know about it. And it's pretty cool to get the summary of then and now, especially we made a lot of splash in 2017. Then there was the 20, what do you say? 2020, I think it was, or 2019 was the the, the time that containers were on Lambda. That was a big splash. And then yep, I have Yeah, and I, because I haven't had to use them personally, I haven't really paid attention to the, the, the sort of the feature progression or um, uh, that we've that we've had. So that's a pretty cool slide. It's these? modest, right? Like it, it's, it, it happens slowly. And then the things that are big, um, they, they're, they're major, but I, I, I think what you'll notice over time from the AWS team that I've seen them do, and I think function URLs are a great example is they're going to make it really easy, uh, for you to get a web application up. And I think the Lambda web adapter was just a great example. I, I think most of us write web apps. Um, you know, there's still some hard things like environment variables that make that hard to do, but like they're, they're continually making this environment more of like what I dreamed, which is like, I just want to take a container and ship it somewhere. And I don't want to think about anything else, mm -hmm. right? Like, unfortunately you do, right? If, if you're all in with AWS, uh, setting up databases, there's no planet scale, right? <laughs> uh, there's VPCs and other stuff like that. But like from a container runtime perspective of like, hey, can I get a container up and running? I gotta admit, it's gotten really nice. Hmm. There's some colleagues of mine that would love to that are loving hearing that, so I appreciate that, Ken. <laughs> um, and we're we're constantly listening uh, to folks like yourself, Ken, to to improve those services every day. Um, from that side, um, we, you mentioned that there was 
a couple transitions at Custom Inc. Uh, you know, from on-premise to cloud, then cloud to or mm. cloud to EC2 compute, and then to containers, and now Lambda. Do you, do you have uh, environments or architectures where you have Lambda communicating with services that are running on an EKS cluster, for example? And oh, and yeah. what yeah, so how, what does that look like? So just to kind of give an idea that it's not it's not all or nothing for one of these services. Mm. Most of the time, sure. it's uh, you know we're we're mostly working on not these hello world architectures where it's just like one <laughs> thing running in one environment but it, oftentimes it's a heterogeneous architecture with different services talking to each other what what are some of the um what are some of the patterns there do you want to talk a little bit more about that i think they'll just look normal like other architecture patterns so for example if you went to customink.com right now and went to the product catalog that is a rails app that is running uh, on aws lambda and you can imagine there's going to be backend merchandising systems where they have to pull data from. So they're just they're making API calls from the catalog application uh, to go to the merchandising system. They're probably also making API calls to quoting and pricing systems as they're uh, uh, as you're pulling up certain styles and people are going like, well, I'm interested in this one versus that one, and this is the quantity that I have. Uh, everything is talking to everything, and from the engineer's point of view, whether it's on Lambda or Kubernetes, is not really sort of an architecture concern, right? Like We've explored in multiple areas, uh, like probably other big companies. Uh, just because you're using Lambda doesn't mean like, oh, well, there, you know, Customix all in on Lambda. No, uh, Customix all in on Kubernetes. No, right? We're we're organically just building these things out, figuring it out, uh, and always trying to get better at it. Very cool. But I can't think. I, I can't think of an architecture though where it's like. Um, I will say this though. I will say this. With AWS Lambda right now, it is a little bit difficult to run an internal only application, right? So it's gonna really shine for public facing URL. So like things like um, getting API gateway stood up for an internal only application is actually a little wizard, right? Like it's it's kind of weird. And it's a, it's a setup where you have to set up a VPC endpoint and other things like that. From the engineer's perspective, they're just hitting an HTTP endpoint that's internal. But I would say that Lambda is pretty hard to set up for internal uh, internal use cases from an HTTP standpoint. <laughs> interesting. That's a that's an interesting use case, and uh, I, I know some uh, AWS uh, folks will be listening to this, so hopefully they'll they'll hear that feedback. Please. So going back, <laughs> yeah, this is a good discussion. I was just thinking, going back to our original discussion around your your criteria for lambda lambdaizing something. <laughs> Well, I will say, I, at, 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 you know, so I'm sorry for interrupting, Brett, but I will say no, like, no, to the answer Normal's question, one of the things that we found out at Custom Inc. is, is that we don't really create new workloads often. But what people are doing is when they do reach for a new workload or a new microservice that needs to sort of fit in to fit a business need, we're spinning it up on Lambda first, uh, just because it's easier from an organization and an operational point just to get that up and running for the engineers to do it themselves. Um, we are spinning up new services on Kubernetes, but I think by far most of the new things that we're doing are on AWS Lambda, and we've sort of leaned into JavaScript, uh, Express, uh, and little micro frameworks like that. New term Lambda, I see. Did I say that? I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's better than what I said. I think I added too many syllables. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned the 30 seconds, like a hard cutoff. Was it 30 seconds? Did you say 30 mm -hmm. seconds? Um, yes. That's for and the... Uh... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. That's for the API uh, gateway response. Oh, API um, gateway. Right. The right. Lambda, and, and you can break you can break that now too with function URL. So, like, if you turn on streaming, which you get for free with the Lambda Web Adapter, and you turn on streaming, then technically, I haven't exercised this to the degree, but technically, you can have up to fifteen minutes to respond. Mm -hmm. But it's fifteen minutes are maybe around twenty megabytes, right? So you can break the six megabyte barrier with streaming up to twenty megabytes. So in theory, you could turn that 20 megabytes really down low and take 15 minutes to get to somebody, technically, but I haven't explored that yet. So like I have some workloads now which are breaking the 30 second barrier, you know, because they're maybe streaming uh, Gen AI responses or stuff like that. Right. So you mentioned Lambda first. I'm sitting here thinking about other developers and them maybe having previously considered Lambda early days and they maybe chose another route. And, you know, we all... We all like golden paths, right? That's the kind of a newer term that I've learned around like, the idea that we 
we set up a design pattern so that it's easy mode for the developers. And you're you're basically saying it's it's for your team, it's easy mode for developers to get started with a new executable, they, a new binary they need to run, a new web URL they need to receive, and they they decide Lambda first. And then if it doesn't meet some of these metrics or guidelines, is like the Kubernetes the backup option? Is that how it goes? I don't really design, see stuff moving back and forth a lot. Like there's just a, um, some apps, like uh, I saw one team recently where they had to, where streaming was important, right? And they just started off with Kubernetes and I don't really see things moving uh, back and forth a lot. So right. uh, a lot of those smaller, right? So typically at Custom Inc, we have these, our teams and our applications sort of centered around larger domains, right? Like, you know, merchandising or sort of fulfillment systems or uh, pricing or checkout and things like that. Uh, so you don't really see these sort of big Jupiter size workloads just show up often. Right. So, uh, as right. we're a lot of times we're, you know, at custom Inc, we're sort of breaking things up, right. Not just because we like microservices, but eventually you start to understand the ley lines of your architecture and what needs to be more so owned by different teams than, than other teams. Right. So the, the architecture breaks up naturally, uh, you know, because the business tells it to not because of the architecture. And usually when that happens and these new services spin up, they don't really go one way or the other, right? Again, like I've never seen Lambda not be able to meet or beat a Kubernetes on the P99 and, and maybe even further uh, for transaction stuff. So it just, people just, you know, there's no need to go into all the Kubernetes stuff and, and move any of it to Lambda. Um, it's just, they're just, they're doing the thing there and that's fine. And I hadn't seen yeah. an architecture use case yet that sort of, like that usually just happens right at the beginning again, like the uh, the response streaming, and then they just stay there. Are you mostly containers, all containers? Like, what, do you have like a mental okay. ratio? Like, <laughs> yeah, we're all containers now. Like, that's okay. a big deal for us, right? Because I, th I think yeah. there might be one like EC2 instance still s sitting around. Well, I mean, it's EKS, right? So that's mm -hmm. EC2 on the back end. So EC2 is still there, um, but like everything is on containers. There might be one workload. I think I saw something the other day where somebody needed to spin up, need to get to that thing, but it's maybe just one, right? And okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety nine percent. Ninety nine percent containers. Yeah, that's. And and the, how, how are we doing on that, Brad? Is that is that a good number or like I haven't really? <laughs> I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> old old stuff that doesn't die <laughs> is an issue, right? Like it just works. Mm -hmm. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Uh, that that everyone has that, right? Everyone. So I'm not really counting yeah. necessarily that, but I think like it sounds like. You know, when I hear teams that say we are like you have to be container or you need a very special exception. And, um, you know, I think years ago, I think 2020 was the first time I walked into a large enterprise. It was a bank. It was a national bank in America. Um, and they, you know, we were coming in with a new product and they basically gave us this standard do standards document. And it essentially said you must be container you're going to be running on Kubernetes and you can't have root. Uh, you know, you can't have any uh, sudo privileges. So, and that was like for anything you want to do at our company, mm -hmm. anywhere. And I thought that that was such, a, it was a great hardline standard, And but they they gave you all the information you needed to know and like, how can you, you know, we can help you if you if you need wow. it. Uh, and it was, and I, I just giggled because I was like, I don't think of large enterprises as the ones setting these sort of hardline standards of container first, always container. Um, so you're definitely, I think you're still on the, uh, you're you're still leading edge. Like I think that's okay. a, that's a pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that are still and, struggling to adopt containers, especially in monolith legacy solutions that they traditionally have that they that just work. Oh, today. and we have we have legacy. Cosmic's been in business for 25 years, so. Yeah. There's there's legacy and we've successfully containerized them and that was very intentional. It took us a couple of years, but like uh, and and I'll say like maybe other companies do this as well. And this is a message for people that that do this. But like we try to beat ourselves up a lot, right? Like we could be better. We mm -hmm. could do this, yeah. You know, but I think we're doing fine. And you know, the grass is not always greener elsewhere. Like uh, a lot of people get on these shows and we talk about stuff like that. But like uh, it, it is comforting to hear that maybe we're doing better than we think we are. But we're always pushing mm -hmm. ourselves to be better. Um, uh, but here in the, like, yeah, we're a hundred percent on containers pretty much. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, you're, you're doing great, Ken. Keep it up. <laughs> Thanks uh, for sure. Thank you. I needed that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tr trust me. And, and, and the, the, uh, um, there's lots of organizations and they're all at different parts of their journey. Um, so it's mm -hmm. awesome 
uh, it's it's great for folks to learn some of the lessons that you learned through through your uh, through your jo your career journey and at, at, at Custom Inc. for sure. Um, we have some awesome questions. Um, do we want to pick some of those up, Brett? Yeah, sure. Throw them out. Um, I think we have a question around uh, from. I think Yayo, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, can we use Lambda for HTTP and sockets at the same time? Mm. Okay, so let me think on this for a sec. So definitely for HTTP, right? And those are gonna be like when we uh, show the picture of the Lambda web adapter, and that could either be routed through uh, uh, either a Lambda function URL, API gateway, or even an application load balancer. Each one of those have their pros and cons. And I think the Lambda function URL is uh, the only con for that one for me it, because it's the clear winner is that it, you can't really set that up uh, for an internal URL. So WebSockets, uh, you can use WebSockets, but you have to re-engineer your application and you're basically using API Gateway at that point. And the WebSocket path is typically going to be different than the path that your app has. But let's say if you have a custom domain name and it's my app dot or example dot com and it's a Rails app and normally Rails apps with uh, WebSockets use the slash cable path. So those could be basically those end up to be in two API gateway instances. Right. And then you, you would use something like CloudFront to, to, to take the, the, the slash cable and you would route it to the other origin, which would be one API gateway. And then that could reach back into your application and it would send uh, webhooks events like uh, connect, default, and disconnect, right? So you get all these events right back to your application. Uh, that's going to be a lot different than if you've used uh, WebSockets with Kubernetes. So, you know, big call out there. That's, that's not like, hey, I got a workload on Kubernetes and it uses WebSockets and I can move it over to Lambda. Uh, you will be DIY in some, some things. If your workload is more smaller and it's like a, a small express app you're probably can do what you're looking to do there so it like like a lot of these questions it kind of just depends on what you're trying to accomplish it depends but, um yeah. uh, <laughs> I, 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 as much as we'd like to think that our workloads are the same or that they're snowflakes it's it's the degrees and difference in between that that's the the details matter so um, yeah. In terms of the the word same time, um, there's a lot of nuance when you say at the same time. So uh, might might need to kind of go into a little bit more detail around that question. Um, there's another mm -hmm. question: How do you configure Lambda URLs nicely with domain names to exceed uh, CloudFront API gateway response times? And I noticed that you had posted a link to to something. Um, do you want to kind of go into that? Yeah, I don't know if I answered the question well. See, so it's domain names with R53, so that's Route 53. Mm -hmm. And the question said to exceed uh, CloudFront. Wait a minute. API CloudFront API gateway response time. Or is that, does that exceed? Maybe the question is, does that exceed? But to exceed CloudFront API gateway response time. So if your origin is, if you need more than 30 seconds for the response time, and CloudFront lets you have more than 30 seconds, uh, API gateway on the back, you're not going to like, there's no escape hatch there, right? Like, uh, like, I don't think you're not going to get more time out of it, right? So like, uh, I can't think of a way to use CloudFront to get more response limits, right? So like, yeah, I can't think of, I can't think of it. Okay. It's, I think uh, there's a follow-up, which is, don't you still hit the CloudFront and API gateway response limits though? Yes. Yeah. If you're using yeah. those. Yeah. It um, is the that will be the 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 weak link in the chain, right? Like that's your least common denominator. So if the thing at the bottom is not going to do it, then it doesn't really matter what the thing at the top can do. Yeah. Um, I noticed sense. that you you posted a lambda lambi dot cloud link. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what lamb lambi is? Yeah, I'll post that again. So that is the way to ship. Um, it does not use the Lambda web adapter. So it is the way to ship a Rails app to AWS Lambda that that really sort of gets down into the low, how the event is transposed from API gateway to the Rails application. Now, I actually probably should do some work here to make this more portable with the Lambda web adapter. Uh, but from your perspective, the Rails app doesn't change, right? So we've Lambda, Lambda has moved far enough now to where, and I think if you went to the quick start uh, link at the top there, 
and maybe scroll down a little bit to the uh, the Docker containers or an architecture. I think there's an architecture diagram. Oh, how Lambi works. I'm sorry, Brett. The second link on the left side. Thank you. And then, yeah. So this is how it works on the inside, right? Again, it's going to work with Lambda function URLs, API gateway, uh, or an application load balancer. The thing in the middle of how the invoke model works. I don't want people to care about that, right? Like that's evaporating. Um, it's important if you want to understand how you can take advantage of Lambda with like my Rails workload, my background jobs, and then hooking into like event-driven architectures using uh, sort of nail, uh, native features with Rails. Um, but at the end of the day, Lambi basically, it's, it's the best piece of engineering I've ever written because it takes a hash and it converts it into another hash. So you get all this magic because I take, I take a, an object in JavaScript, uh, you know, a dictum, maybe in Python, a dictionary, right? And then like a hash in Ruby and I just convert it to another hash and then all this magical stuff just works. <laughs> like you could just run Rails on Lambda. Uh, uh, and that's the middle layer, right? Which I don't think people should want to care about, but it allows your Rails application to, uh, to bolt right directly to the Lambda runtime interface. Again, without changing any of the code, right? You don't have to change any of the internal code. Cool. Um, cool. So, Brett, do we want to? Do we have any more questions, or are we at? We've gone through all of them. Um, with function URLs, there's still no way to hide them behind a custom domain, right? That's Alex T. No, question. No, you definitely can. You, know, you have to use CloudFront to do that, uh, which is fine because CloudFront doesn't cost anything unless you're using it. Uh, so it's definitely the way to get uh, a custom domain name on uh, function URLs. I will say it gets a little bit harder if you have like a, this is for advanced. So if you have like an active active uh, DR strategy where you're running your workloads geographically in one region and in another region, and you need regional custom domain names and then another domain name to route underneath that. So that actually ends up being this uh, triple Lindy of three cloud <laughs> front distributions. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so can't run function URLs internally, but yes, you can run function URLs with a custom domain name, but just simply standing up a CloudFront distribution in front of it. Ooh, Conrad's got a good question. Are there any sample Lambda project repositories with architecture diagrams to help people get started? Ooh. Well, I wrote uh, this one. Here, I have one in the chat. If, if you want to pull that up, I have one, which is ser go to serverlessland.com. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Ken, if you have something to pull up as well. Yeah, I'll share this, uh, this screen right here. So I just uh, wrote a blog post the other day. Oh, wait a minute. Here it goes. Uh, this one. There we go. So I wrote a, a blog post the other day uh, called uh, From Rags to Riches. Uh, which talks about how to use retrieval augment generation from AIs uh, to hook into proprietary data. And it is basically a Lambda. I think I got an architecture diagram in here somewhere. Uh, it actually might be the, uh, I'll just quickly go over here to dev2 dashboard. Yes, yeah, so it is a application that fits into this architecture right here. Um, it, it's basically an express.js app, which talks to AI. And you could just sort of clone this repo if you wanted to use uh, stand up a quick AWS Lambda. It's express.js if you wanted to talk to AI and experiment with retrieval patterns with proprietary data. AI is in everything now, so I think most people will want to play with it. Uh, but yeah, it's a, a, it doesn't have an architecture diagram like, say, this this pattern here. Like, So one of the cool things that we were able to do when we started exploring Lambda is that it's automatically there in all your AWS accounts, right? So unlike Kubernetes, where you kind of have to stand up Kubernetes and the VPCs and the EC2 clusters and stuff, Lambda is just there and ready to use. So I thought this was really interesting in that it was a particular workload uh, modeled after a workload that we had done at Custom Inc, where it was like, hey, we wanted it to be highly available, active, active in both regions, uh, you know, doing some really clever things with DynamoDB global tables and cross-region replication S3 buckets. Uh, so this is again on speaker deck and I can post these in the show notes. But it's a, I think it's a really neat reference architecture for uh, what you can do with Lambda that it's kind of harder to do in other containerization systems. Those are two great examples. I'm excited to try that uh, 
that rags to riches uh, example application. That sounds awesome. Yeah, because AI is going to eat us all. <laughs> <laughs> That's another show. That's another show, Ken. <laughs> all right. Um, Very nice. Oh, Man, we, we covered so much on this show, but we could go another three hours. I, I have all these other questions that are, are uh, they're not really Lambda questions, but, you know, talking about custom ink, we're going to have to have you back on the show, Ken, just talking about uh, languages, oh, frameworks. To. We had questions of people talking about Ruby and containers, like just the general situation of a developer choosing languages and choosing deployment methodologies like that. That's like a, we could have a series of 10 episodes with the three of us on that, I think, I think like, cool. um, but this has been great. Uh, I feel like for those that are getting started in Lambda, we've got resources for them. For those that are catching up on the latest stuff, we've got stuff for them. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I just learned a ton today. So I'm excited. To, that's really the secret of why I have this show is just to invite people on to teach me stuff. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, and me, and me for y'all. Like uh, y'all gave me an A today on containers uh, uh, for custom make. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Stamped, stamp of approval. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you so much for being on our show today ken yeah thank you all so much too i appreciate you yeah and of course we'll have all the links in the show notes and the podcast will be out sometime later this year and you will be able to listen to lambda on your way to work or on walking your dog or however you listen to your podcast so lambda we will eyes. be back here next week sadly without ken but we have a whole bunch of other stuff planned coming up. We got MultiPass. You probably have heard about that tool. That's coming up on the show. Uh, we're here live every Thursday. So if you didn't get your questions answered today, so sorry. We try to do as best as we can. But jump in next week. We'll have a Q&A episode where it's nothing but questions and answers. And we'll see you back here live next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Bye, all. <laughs>